committee started for this afternoon. Got a full agenda today. And so I'll call the meeting to order. First item is the approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to we'll approve move. the second. agenda? Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay, carries. And next up is the minutes from August 13th. Um, is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Carries. That takes us to the four items on our consent agenda where we have the comp plans and, and comprehensive sewer plans for the city of Ridgefield, city of Lakeville, city of Minnetonka Beach, and the city of Columbia Heights. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Move approval. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Carries and congratulations to those communities. That takes us to our non-consent agenda. And the first item is the comp plan and comprehensive sewer plan for the city of Minneapolis. Mr. Colvin. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, on today's agenda, we have two non-consent comprehensive uh, plan uh, actions. Uh, both of these uh, plans represent um, contents that are just a little bit unique. So I thought that uh, in the interest of the committee, I would uh, present these um, and just uh, kind of explain what kind of makes uh, these elements a little bit unique uh, for each one of these two plans. So the first item uh, for action is uh, requesting approval of the city of Minneapolis's comprehensive sewer plan. Uh, Minneapolis's plan uh, was presented at the Community Development Committee uh, last week and then will be forwarded on to the council's um, agenda on September 29th um, that reflects the, uh, the meeting that was canceled on, on the 11th. Information uh, uh, regarding the Minneapolis's plan. Um, most of you know that's located in Hennepin County. Um, the plan uh, reflects uh, between 2020 and 2040, reflects a household growth uh, projection of uh, 21,800. That represents a little over uh, 1,000 units uh, per year during that 20 year period. City of Minneapolis has been identified uh, and has been part of the regional INI program. Uh, they've been identified as being a, a, a contributor to excess INI in the system. Uh, the city has committed uh, over six million dollars in INI mitigation work uh, since 2011. Uh, they have also, as part of that, uh, part of that work was funded by a state bond grant that was awarded uh, through the council to the city. Uh, in the amount of uh, $1.8 million. Uh, the city's plan represents or includes goals uh, for, uh, um, includes goals, policies, and strategies for continuing the reduction of INI in both the public and private uh, collection systems. Uh, they have an ordinance that uh, prohibits the connection of foundation drains and sump pumps and also requires their disconnection upon discovery. And they do also include a point of sale disclosure and an inspection on any property that is sold within, uh, within the community. Also, the Metropolitan Council in the city of Minneapolis entered into a memorandum of understanding in 2008. Uh, actually, uh, the, uh, the MOU was updated in 2008. The original uh, memorandum of understanding was actually entered in uh, to with the city a couple years prior to that. And what that uh, MOU does is it pre-describes the level of effort that Minneapolis will uh, do to mitigate excess INI into the system. So in lieu of waiting for the council to notify them of an exceedance and then a resulting work plan, they actually committed to doing a certain amount of work up front. So it reflects a more proactive approach uh, to regional INI mitigation. Now the Minneapolis plan uh, is is unique in that uh, so far it's it's uh, a plan that reflects a truly integrated approach to 
uh, water, water management. Uh, the most communities plans when they come in, they'll have a, they'll have separate chapters for wastewater and for water supply and surface water. Where Minneapolis actually has a water management plan that integrates surface water management with the sanitary uh, or the wastewater plan. And some examples of that is um, through the I and I mitigation program. They recognize and experience that. That a lot of the a lot of the stormwater uh, that gets generated from downspout disconnections and sump pumps and foundation drains ends up uh, it needs to go somewhere, and so the plan recognizes the the results of the INI program, then addresses how the city wants to or needs to address that that surface water. So again, these were combined in that certain chapter in that uh, water management plan. Also, another example is once uh, once the surface water gets generated, it gets uh, redirected from going into the sanitary system. They recognize there's a need to have to do something with that stormwater. So it also lays out a strategy of uh, creating uh, ponding areas that are are in areas that wouldn't influence the sanitary sewer uh, system, like uh, flooded manholes, or in areas that uh, might be susceptible to infiltration, uh, that might um, cause uh, flow getting into the sanitary sewer system. So it lays out in those particular cases where stormwater retention is being employed, it lays out uh, a process of making sure that the underlying wastewater system isn't susceptible to that I and I. So again, this integrated approach, it recognizes that that the efforts in one area of the system could impact other areas of the system. So uh, because of this integrated approach, um, unlike most communities, when when the council takes an action on a wastewater plan, it's a pretty simple, uh, it reflects basically taking the sewer chapter out and that's what we're, you know, that's what the council is approving is that sewer chapter. In this particular case, because it's integrated and because there are specific statutory uh, obligations or requirements of the council to approve a wastewater plan, the, uh, the plan action on today's item is specifically related to approval of the wastewater plan. So that's, that's, that's basically the only reason why I'm bringing the Minneapolis plan here as, as an action is to recognize, to acknowledge and recognize that, that nuance in their water management plan and the action that the council takes specific to the wastewater plan. And also, uh, the, um, I took a look because of um, some of the um, uh, discussions and uh, notoriety of the city's uh, reguiding of land uses. I also uh, put together this slide here that compares the city's 2030 plan from 10 years ago to the city's 2040 plan. And with this, uh, by comparing the, the, the 2020 and 2030 projections that appear in both plans, uh, the new plan uh, reflects uh, reflects an addition of, um, see if I got this right here, about 11,000, 11,500 homes for 2030 and uh, approximately uh, 8,700 homes for 2020. So when you consider the size of Minneapolis and the fact that uh, they're projecting uh, of having um, over 200,000 homes within the community by 2040, those increases really uh, don't uh, represent a significant portion of the city's total household count. So under the findings, uh, the plan uh, uh, um, contains the, the three C's as we call them. It conforms to the regional wastewater system plan. It's consistent uh, with other council adopted uh, plans and policies. It's, uh, it conforms to the adjacent communities plans. Uh, it satisfies all the plan, uh, plan requirements and the wastewater uh, system uh, with its uh, scheduled improvements will have capacity to accommodate uh, the city of Minneapolis' growth. And uh, there's one advisory that is included on all of the business items and that is that uh, the city uh, will submit a copy of the city resolution that adopts our 2040 comprehensive plan to, to the council once it's been uh, once it's been adopted locally. 
So uh, today's action on the Minneapolis Conference of Sewer Plan is that the Metropolitan Council adopt the advisory comments and review, review record and approve the recommendations of the Environment Committee as written in the business item, which includes approval of the Comprehensive Sewer Plan component of the City of Minneapolis's Comprehensive Plan. Thank you very much. I've got a question or two. Yes. And I think in, in previous committee meetings, we've talked about sump pumps and rain meters. And um, so you noted that in Minneapolis, they have an ordinance that prohibits these types of connections to the sanitary sewer system. And I'm wondering, um, is it allowed in any community in our region? Mr. Chair. Uh, members of the committee, uh, the uh, Unified Plumbing Code actually was revised back in 2015, I believe, and it it does specifically prohibit the connection of clear water connections uh, to the sanitary to the sanitary system uh, without any clause for grandparenting. So, um, most communities um, recognizing that have now since 2015 have adopted. Um, ordinances that are consistent with that uh, um, prohibition of uh, the clear water connections. However, the code, um, plumbing code doesn't specifically address uh, the requirements for the disconnection of these, uh, these clear water connections once they're discovered. So we're still seeing many communities that are in the process of adopting those disconnection ordinances. Uh, Minneapolis uh, does have the um, the, uh, the ordinance that requires the disconnection of a sump pump and foundation drain uh, upon discovery. And of course, as I indicated, they also have that point of sale inspection program where whenever there's a transaction of real estate there, um, the city goes in and inspects for conformance. Okay, so it's a little hit, hit and miss on cities that are actually requiring the disconnect. Yeah, correct. They're not allowed. New ones aren't allowed. Code says no but whether or not they're required to disconnect them, hit or, hit or miss, depending on the community. Correct, Mr. Chair. It, it appears that uh, most communities are still in the process of, of um, uh, drafting and approving those disconnection uh, ordinances, but at this time, uh, we, have, um, we do have a couple of communities have, that have acknowledged that they do not have such an ordinance, disconnection ordinance. Thank you. Um, I have another follow-up question uh, on a separate topic. The integrated approach that you talked about with Minneapolis, it sounds like you're in favor of the approach that they took. And I'm wondering if you would see that as a model, thinking about the comprehensive plans that communities will start to work on in six, seven, eight years. Would this be a model for ways to do it in the future or is this unique to Minneapolis or unique to large communities or what do you what are your thoughts on that uh, mr. chair members of the committee I do I do um, feel that this is probably an emerging trend that we're going to see um, I have reviewed another community's plan that 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 uh, represents uh, an integrated approach maybe not to the level of actually having a, a chapter that's truly integrated that's not really separable if you will between the you know between the three water systems but um, I, I do uh, there's a lot more discussion uh, for in, at the local level about taking a more integrated approach on on water planning thank you Other questions from the committee very good is there a motion to approve 2019-231 City of Minneapolis 2040 Comp Plan and Comprehensive Sewer Plan. So moved. And do I hear a second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Carries. Thank you. And that takes us to City of Oakdale. Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, the City of Oakdale's plan. Um, was uh, also heard at last week's uh, Community Development Committee. Uh, it also is scheduled for council action on September 29th. City of Oakdale uh, is located in Washington County. Uh, their plan represents a total household growth between 2040 and 20, 
I'm sorry, between 2020 and 2040 of uh, 2,900 households, which averages out to about 145 uh, households per year. Uh, they have been identified uh, by the council as being a contributor to excess I and I. They have been part of uh, the council's uh, I and I mitigation program uh, since 2014. The city has completed uh, $350,000 of I and I mitigation work. Part of that work also um, was funded by state bond grants administered uh, by the council. Uh, those grants that were just uh, just less uh, just shy of twenty nine thousand dollars in total. Uh, the city's plan includes defined goals, policies, and strategies for reducing I and I in both the public and private system. Uh, it also has a an ordinance that prohibits the connection of clear water sources and requires the disconnection of those sources upon discovery. And uh, also unique to the city of not unique, but um, included in the city of Oakdale's plan is where is a program whereby they will provide a sump pump connection service line, if you will, um, out of the front of the yard. So to those properties that have uh, active sump pumps uh, in an effort to provide a, a dedicated long-term disconnection of that sump pump from the sanitary system, they'll actually provide a pipe out front for the homeowner to, to connect to. So a proactive approach on on um, eliminating those connections. One of the unique characters of this plan, and this um, I believe at a couple of meetings ago, Council Member Wolf uh, asked the question of me that if we ever had a plan that triggers an improvement, would, you know, would I bring that up before the committee? Uh, City of Oakdale's plan kind of sort of does that. Um, there is part of the gold line, uh, the BRT project, uh, Oakdale has a uh, stop, um, a, a bus stop uh, program for that. And they have uh, TOD development associated with that. And it's in an area of the community that um, uh, currently, uh, there's a city of Oakdale has a pipe that an adjoining community like Elmo uses for wastewater services and that's done through a cooperative agreement. Uh, the council recognized that that was an interim uh, situation. And so we have already programmed in, this, in our capital program an interceptor improvement project that will provide a, a permanent dedicated service to Lake Elmo. So although the plan, yes, does include development in an area that's going to trigger uh, a, a regional improvement, it's an improvement that's already already in our capital program and scheduled. And um, uh, we will next year start the uh, preliminary design process of that. So just maybe just to kind of describe this a little bit. So basically, we've got Oakdale, Lake Elmo, and Woodbury here. And if you take a look, the city of Lake Elmo has a lift station located here, and then it pumps flow to get to the Oakdale's local collection system. And then from there, uh, Oakdale system conveys flow to our interceptor, which is this red line. And so the BRT station is basically in this location here. So when this development uh, occurs, the city of Oakdale will then require or will need that capacity they provided in that local 10 inch line. And so our project uh, includes uh, really a multi-step uh, system of improvement, some of which we've already made. Uh, the city of Woodbury here has an existing force main that no longer is being used as part of their command system. So the council right now is in the process of acquiring that existing pipe. So that, that pipe there, uh, we don't own, but been in active negotiations with the city of Woodbury for over two years and uh, we're continuing that process of acquiring that line. Then uh, a number of years ago, five, six years ago, the council constructed a force main located along a radio drive and along the frontage road here as part of the county uh, improvement project for County 13. So that piece of pipe is also included in, in the ground. Uh, however, in order to connect uh, those two uh, pieces of pipe, 
uh, we have to go back and make a connection that connects the, the new pipe, the one that we're going to acquire here. And then also, we need to extend uh, the force main uh, across I-94 to get to the north side of the freeway in order to uh, allow a connection for the city of uh, Lake Elmo to redirect their devastation. So it's a, it's a um, complicated uh, series of events that has to take place, but uh, as I indicated, it's, uh, they are improvements that, that are already in our capital program. So with that, the comprehensive sewer plan findings, it contains the three C's. Um, the regional wastewater system, uh, once, these, um, once these improvements as, that I outlined are completed, uh, the system will have capacity to provide uh, wastewater services uh, reflected in the City of Oakdale's plan. And uh, the same advisory, they need to include a copy of the resolution that adopts uh, their plan to the council. And then today's proposed action uh, is that the Metropolitan Council adopt the advisory comments and review of the record and approve the proposed recommendations of the Environment Committee as written in the business item, which includes approval of the City of Oakdale's comprehensive sewer plan. Questions for Mr. Goldman. Would Council Member Vento like to make a motion? I move approval. Second. Motion's been made and seconded to approve Oakdale's comp plan and comprehensive sewer plan. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that takes us to the last item on our non-consent business item. Mr. Marinas, welcome. Good afternoon, <coughs> Mr. Chair, council members. Uh, the subject of business item 2019-238 is a Vector Service Contract Amendment. A little background for you. Vector services are a specialty operation necessary for the continued reliable operation of wastewater treatment facilities. In May of 2018, bids were solicited for a two-year contract to provide routine service at eight of our MCS facilities. Two contracts were, were awarded. Contract 18P-127A to Schlumpka Services for 316,000 and some additional dollars. And contract 18P-127B to Goliath Hydroback for 163,000 and again, some additional dollars for a total not to exceed contract value of $480,000. This funding level was based on anticipated need and past history. Over the first year of this two-year contract, costs exceeded these estimates due to high solids dep deposition from sustained wet, water, wet, wet weather flow and a critical response needed to a polymer system disruption at the Metro plant. These amendments will allow for continued service through the remaining contract period with a built-in provision for contingencies. Funds for these amendments will be covered in the annual operating budget of each facility. So today's proposed action is that the Metropolitan Council approve amending Vactus, Vactor Service Contracts 18P-127A to Schlumpka Services in the amount of $330,000 and 18P-127B to Goliath Hydrovac in the amount of $70,000 for a combined additional amount of $400,000 increasing the total contract not to exceed amount of $880,000. With that, I'd be glad to take any questions. It'd be helpful for me if I had a very quick 101 on what Vactor services are. As I understand it, they're like giant vacuum cleaners and they suck up the bad stuff. Help me out here. Mr. Chair, you are correct. Think of them as a very powerful shop vac that can suck up any sort of solids that you might come across. 
And this is a valuable service for operating wastewater treatment systems. As you might imagine, there are plenty of solids that enter our facilities. Uh, we have very efficient ways of dealing with those solids. That said, you can get solids into portions of the treatment process that need to be removed with these vector services. So they're large, they're large trucks with large tanks on them, and again, very powerful vacuums that can vacuum up solids. Um, could say throughout our plant. So this is a service that we need at the plants to be able to continue to operate. Um, this, this contract again was set up with the idea of based on historical usage, we should be good with this, the original funding amount for two years, but a couple of uh, special situations or unusual situations came up that led to uh, increased usage of the contract. Question, yeah. Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, I have a question, okay, so we suck out the solids, uh, then it, does, what happens to the solids after that? Do they uh, get incinerated or where, how does that work? Mr. Chair and council members, those solids in many cases are brought back to the treatment plant. And depending upon the consistency of the solids, we have a couple of different areas to deposit the solids. In, in many cases, the solids are of a more uh, grainy, dry nature. So they get put on a pad and ultimately loaded into a dumpster and uh, deposited at a landfill. Question. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Marinas. Um, I'm just wondering, is this a service that could ever be provided by the Metropolitan Council by our own staff and <coughs> purchase of the equipment, or is it not cost effective uh, long range? Mr. Chair, council members, we actually do have our own vector services that our interceptor services business unit um, has the vehicles, the equipment, the expertise to do that. We use those for uh, maintaining our own collection system. Um, and we have found that there's enough work for them with our own collection system that we want to contract separately for the treatment plants with an outside vendor so that we were not interrupting or pulling away our vector equipment from our own system maintenance. Okay, thank you. Great question. Um, great questions. Uh, the the polymer system disruption, remind me what that was all about. Mr. Chair and council members, I'll give you a little background on that. So polymer is a chemical we use at the treatment plants for dewatering our solids, the solids that are collected as part of the treatment process. The dewatering of the solids uh, allows the solids to um, we put in a condition where they're dry enough to be put into, in this case at the Metro plant, our incinerators. Polymer is a chemical. Actually at Metro, we have two polymers we use that we've determined depending upon certain uh, conditions or situations, we'll use one polymer over the other to optimize the dewatering. Though they're similar of use, they are incompatible if you ever brought those two uh, uh, chemicals together. Uh, in this case, um, last fall, one of my operators that was new to the Metro plant made a mistake. We took a delivery of one polymer and we introduced it into the uh, storage uh, vessel of the other polymer. Well, when these two chemicals came together, they congealed into, think of it as a very sticky jello-like sub substance, which subsequently plugged up many of our pipes and tanks for our polymer delivery system. As you might expect, this compromised our ability to really efficiently and effectively dewater our solids at the Metro plant. So we needed to get that um, situation cleared up quickly. 
and we really needed these shop vacs, if you will, to be able to um, clean out the pipes, the storage tanks, and the equipment that was affected by this um, mistake. And uh, um, Schlumpka Services did a great job, but it took a long time. We consumed or expended a lot of dollars of the contract in getting that cleaned up. And I will add, uh, just to give you some assurances, we've learned from our mistakes. We've put in place some measures that um, should eliminate that from ever happening again. Some training, additional Tra training. Training and, and some, well, and uh, uh, Mr. Chair and council members, we've locked off the delivery caps and we've put the keys in a certain spot where a number of people need to be knowledgeable about who's taken what key and what for. So there is some training involved, but there's actually some hardware type uh, fixes as well that took place. Very good. Other questions? Is there a motion to approve these amendments? So moved. Motion's been made. Second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay? Carries. Thank you very much. That takes us to the information portion of our agenda. Yeah. Where we're going to hear about water resources. It's an important part of what the council is all about. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Council Members. Um, I'm Judy Svensak. I'm the manager of the Water Resources Section in Environmental Services, and with me is Dan Henley. He's my assistant manager. And we're here today to kind of give you a high-level overview of what we do in the Water Resources Section. I know that some of you have heard some of the things that we've been doing. You've been had presentations on the Stormwater Grant Program that we have, and you'll be having another one coming up in September to approve those grants. And you've seen some of our work on the Capital Projects Tour or by the presentations by our, by our interns. So like I said, this will be kind of a high level overview of what we do. Um, over the next couple months, we'll have staff who will be coming in to give more detailed specific projects that we have going on as well. So um, what we do in the water resource section is it's really all about providing leadership and information to empower council members, councils, local actions and cities of, to provide local actions that all are really geared at clean, healthy, and sustainable water resources for the region. We do this by working in two main areas. I kind of broke them into like the water monitoring and assessment work we do, and then the planning and policy work that we do. And all of our work supports our responsibility as the regional water planning agency, um, where we're responsible for looking at regional issues around water quality, focusing on protection and restoration of water resources in the region. Our planning work provides directions to communities as they prepare their comprehensive plans. As part of those comprehensive plans, they're required to do local surface water management plans, which are a chapter of those comp plans. Um, and also we work with the watersheds in, in the metro area who are doing watershed management plans for the, the region as well. We work with um, the cities and the watersheds by providing them technical assistance and guidance and direction on what should be in their plans, as well as we provide them a lot of information and data about their lakes, rivers, and streams that they can use in their plans as well. Planning work that we do is done in a very collaborative way with our partners. Um, so I mentioned a little bit about it, but the monitoring we, work we do, some of it is permit required for our wastewater treatment facilities. Um, as well as it's um, part of our responsibility of collecting information about the quality of the resources in the region. It's used for setting goals, it's used for prioritizing projects, prioritizing implementation projects that some of the communities do to um, um, improve and restore their resources, as well as maintaining the quality of all the region's resources. Today we're going to focus on the monitoring that we do for lakes, rivers, and streams. We also um, do have a groundwater monitoring program uh, that really focuses on our facilities and the requirements around that we need to maintain the groundwater levels so that it doesn't impact our tanks and things like that our facilities. So we could answer questions about that, but that was not the focus of today. Also, I'm not, we're not going to focus on the toxicity monitoring that we do, which is um, for our related to our permit requirements. And it's really about testing the toxicity of our effluent to make sure that we're not um, impacting the resources that we discharge to. 
So the work we do has um, several drivers. We have legislative mandates, federal and state mandates for the work that we do, as well as the council's policy from Thrive MSP 2040 and our water resources policy plan directs what we do. Um, in particular, we take a lot of our direction from the, wa from the water sustainability goal, which really is about protecting, conserving, um, the, and utilizing the region's groundwater and surface water in ways that protect public health, support economical growth and development, maintain habitat and ecosystem health, while providing for recreational opportunities, all of which are essential to the quality of life in the region. And then the water policy plan really has two main water related for our work in water resources areas, which is really about the watershed approach and then assessing and protecting regional resources. So we have these two policies with associated strategies. The watershed approach really directs us to work with other partners in the region about um, doing planning and monitoring and assessment of resources all at, aimed at protecting and restoring the region's resources. Um, and then the assessing piece is, um, directs us to do that monitoring that we're doing the lake, river, and stream monitoring. As I mentioned, the policy work um, that we have from Thrive and the Water Policy, policy, policy Plan drive and support our work. Our water resources work is heavily tied to the five principles of Thrive. In particular, though, we focus on how it's impacting the, our stewardship, sustainability, and livability principles. Um, the purpose, purpose of our planning work and our policy work is really to be a leader for the region, provide direction and support to others in areas of surface water planning and management, really to ensure that management programs are being instilled across the region so that we're protecting those water resources. We bring that kind of regional perspective to the partners that we work with. We work with watersheds across the region. We can talk to the watersheds in the west area about what's going on in the east, help them learn by what others are doing, help them you know, work on best practices to use or just learn techniques and tools from each other. As I mentioned, we also, um, review the comprehensive plans, in particular the local water plan part of that. So we're helping through that as well. You know, we have, there's 187 COP plans that review of which there's 181 water plans that we have to look at, um, as well as working with watersheds on their planning. So also over the years, we've really had a strong focus on stormwater management and protection. Um, so we provide technical assistance to others on how to maintain their resources or protect and restore their resources by implementing stormwater best practices. Um, we've also, um, and I'll talk about it more in a minute, had these grant programs to help people put things in place. We've done a small site urban BMP manual that was done years ago that really helped the small sites figure out the best practices to use as they're developing. A lot of those small sites had developed before any best practices were put in place so that basically when it rained, the stormwater would run off in right into the receiving waters without any treatment. Um, and this was done actually before the state did the state stormwater manual. So that kind of then took the bigger approach of looking at all sites. And we were very integral in helping with that state stormwater manual as well. Then we're also interested in learning about the best practices that we're promoting. So at our Empire Wastewater Treatment Facility, we have installed infiltration basins, string bank stabilization projects. We have a wetland, we have green roofs, all to showcase the types of practices that we're promoting throughout the region. We have taken many tours to those facilities, that facility. We also are monitoring the effectiveness of those practices. We're monitoring the green roof to see what's coming off of that. Um, we've been monitoring the infiltration basins and you know we're happy to say that um, we have not had any discharge from our storm practices at that facility, which is really important because it would have discharged to Vermilion River, which is a drought stream. So our role is really about um, providing directions on others to others on best practices that they should use, as well as share information that we have learned and gathered over the years. As I mentioned, the stormwater grant program we have helped partners to install stormwater practices over the years. In the 1990s, we had a huge grant program that funded research, education, and the implementation of practices. We were able to um, restart this program in 2015, so we have had three years of the program, 2015, 16, and 17, um, awarding over $2.8 million worth of grants. These were all aimed at, um, this time around, were aimed at um, stormwater practices that have multiple benefits, so a lot of them had a um, reuse element to them as well as um, 
recharging our waters by the reuse and element. And so they're helping with the water supply situation and the surface water protection and management there. Um, you heard several months ago about the 2019 grant program, which is really focusing this time around on stormwater practices in redevelopment areas, which is also kind of a, a niche area where there's um, not a lot of stormwater practices were put in these redevelopment areas prior to now. So we're going to help with retrofitting and putting in practices at these sites. So we have about $500,000 for that grant program and we'll be bringing back those recommendations to you in September. Council member. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, one quick question related to the grant. So it looks like there was 18 grants over the course of those three years and each county has at least two grants except for Scott. Is there a reason why Scott wasn't awarded grants or did they not seek grants? Sure, Mr. Chair, Council Member. Um, in those years, Scott County did not ask for any grants. We have worked closely with Scott County on many other things. Um, in the past, we worked with that, excuse me, on some modeling that they were doing. So we helped them with some, what's called the SWOT model to develop um, information about the, the transport of um, pollutant through their area. So we helped them with that. Um, we work with them. We have several monitoring sites where we help with a collection of samples for lakes and rivers and streams in that area. So we've kind of worked with them in other ways. They did not ask for a grant for this program. Thank you. Yep. So also tied to our planning and policy work, we do a lot of outreach and collaboration. Um, the purpose is really to help fulfill the council's thrive principle of collaboration, the outcomes of equity and stewardship, and really ES's overall commitment to being a valued leader in water sustainability. So several efforts that we have been involved with related to collaboration, this is obviously not all of them, but just a few snippets of what we've been doing. We started um, the Twin Cities Water Monitoring Data Group uh, several years ago, which is a group that meets um, two times a year of regional partners who are doing water collection of data, or collecting water data, excuse me, and doing analysis of data on streams and lakes throughout the region. So we started out, um, Usually we have one session that's um, more in the field. So we've had a, a session where over 60 people came from different entities, agencies, cities to learn about how to do stream flow measurements so that we're all working from the same page. We had um, the Department of Natural Resources and the USGS came in as experts to show people how to do this. We had a session um, two years ago where we talked about different equipment to be used in the field and had many demonstration projects on that was which really well received. Then we also have meetings where we talk about policy direction and how to do assessments. So we had training on how to do a load assessments and things like that. So normally we get about 60 to 70 people at every one of these meetings has been really well received. We also, um, our whole um, lake monitoring program is really built, built with collaboration in mind. It's called the Citizens Assisted Monitoring Program where we have about usually 150 to 200 lakes in our program a year. Maybe 10 of those we're monitoring on our own. The rest are, we have worked with partners, uh, cities and watersheds and soil and water conservation districts throughout the region. And they actually work with citizens for the most part in their region, in their area. They get the citizens involved. The citizens, who, citizens usually live under the lake and they're the ones actually doing the sampling. So we train, train them on how to take the samples, where to take the samples. Um, we pick up the samples from them and then we analyze them at our lab, and then we produce a report that gives them information back. And we also have another group in that pool that's, uh, it's, it's, it's still in our citizens assistant monitoring program, but it's really state, it's like the watersheds or the SWCDs are really the ones doing the sampling. So we have a combination there. And then we have our watershed outlet monitoring program, which also we partner with um, SWCDs and watersheds and cities at times to help monitor the streams. We've had watershed and community partnerships on planning efforts. We have the MCS Outreach Champions Program. We worked a lot on the 25 by 25 initiative with Governor Dayton, where he went around the state to get input on the issues, how we reduce things 25% by 2025. We really led the ones that helped work with the ones in the metro area. And we're really looking forward to working with Governor Walls on his one Minnesota work in efforts to address climate change in the future. Along with the outreach, we do a lot of public education. Our education efforts are really aimed at protecting water protection, planning and the restoration concepts and getting the youth and general public um, informed about water resources, what they need to do to support and protect them. Um, so we go to the Children's Water Festival every year and we were one of the original groups that helped with that effort. It's been going on for like 21 years now where uh, I think it's 
fourth graders, maybe fifth, it's switched between fourth and fifth graders. So I'm not sure which it is at the moment, but so in September every year, there's probably 600 fourth graders that come to the state fairgrounds and then they learn about all different water practices. And we have several sites at that. Um, we, cert, we go and pro provide education at pollution prevention days. Um, we've partnered with others in trouts in the classroom, and then we work on teacher externships. And really that's about getting the youth and the general public works engaged in what's going on. And so we have that more civic engagement about water protection. So we do collect a lot of data through our monitoring programs, as I mentioned, and these data are used by city staff, watersheds, soil and water conservation districts, researchers, a lot of, we get a lot of calls for our data from students at the U and other colleges, and just a lot of people are checking out the data that we have. Um, so this, we have this environmental information management system where you can find all of the data that we've been collecting over the years. It also has a lot of reports on there. And so it has, you'll be hearing about the lake report that we do every year, I think in, in September. Well, that's one of the reports you can easily access through here. We've done um, recently a comprehensive river report, which you can access through here. And we've also recently done a comprehensive stream report with all our stream data, um, which shows trends and how things are trending over time. So all this information and the raw data or the raw corrected data are available on the site, as well as reports and information so that, you know, it can be used by researchers, it can be used by the general public, it can be used by whomever to learn more about their lake, river, or stream. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan, and he's going to talk specifically about the monitoring programs. Right, and this is really setting that stage for future presentations, and there's been some of the field trips that Judy uh, alluded to, and thanks for coming out to those, um, both rivers and streams so far, and then there will be those presentations coming soon. So this is a big overview slide because it covers essentially two of our programs, rivers and streams. And so looking at the color scheme there, your green dots are the large river sites and the orange dots are the tributary stream sites. So kind of highlighting on the greens to start with, those have been monitored since the 1920s and more intensively since the 1970s, essentially when the Clean Water came up and Clean Water Act came out. So they're strategically located as it's coming, as water is entering our metro region. So you'll see in the Southwest, the Minnesota River coming in at Jordan, Mississippi up at Anoka, and then Stillwater, uh, St. Croix River, and then as they leave the metro region, as well as we don't have it located on the map, but upstream and downstream of our treatment facilities as well. And so that's really helped us tell our story of success in the region, not just from the treatment pr um, pr processes that we've improved, which is a big player in that, but also the non-point um, watershed improvements that, that everyone's been making. And that's, that's statewide for the river, because you can see trends and, and uh, contextual inputs from the um, outstate. And so that's our river program. You know, we look at a lot of different pollutants and we calculate pollutant loads. That's one of the things I can highlight here. And that's really what gives us that context of, you know, what is coming off of our landscape, what's coming out of our treatment plants and what's coming out from outstate. And then how has that changed over time? Judy mentioned the trend report, which is also a big storytelling aspect of that, of just how well, how far we've come, especially since you've got data back to the 20s, which was pre-treatment and it's, it's improved a lot. So looking at the orange dots now, those are the tributary streams. And so much more recent, about late 80s, 18, 1989 is when we first started our Minnesota River sites. So that's your, your southwest of the region. And we expanded that in the mid and late 90s through partnerships. In the previous slides, there was that uh, WAMP or Watershed Outlet Monitoring Program. And so that was a big collaborative effort with the watershed district cities that uh, are managing those watershed, those non-points. So we're, we're partnering with them. They're doing a, a fair amount of the field work. We're helping them with the technical assistance and data workup. And so that's a big piece of it because they want to monitor their streams and we want to help them do that. So we play a important role helping them track and, and you know track how their improvements are effective where should they target some of their practices and they're they're very they've expanded a lot since we started that so they've taken that expertise that we've kind of helped them get and in a way mimicked it upstream they actually refer to their stations as WAMP stations because they mimicked our technology and our processes even though they're not at the outlet so it, it's not a it's kind of a misnomer but we it's kind of our brand so we're okay with it um, 
Yeah, and I mentioned the stream or the, the trends, so that's a big metric that's important. We, we just released our river trends, but a handful of years ago, we came out with a stream trend, and then that's able to give that to the local watershed just to give them a snapshot of how well they're doing. Are we getting better? Is it working? What's not working? What is? So we have some visuals here for you to, to take a look at. So there's on the left side, that's our rivers. Um, might look familiar to Mr. Chair there, getting out on the river boat. That's where we've launched. Although the dock was, I think, 10 feet in the air at the time because it was hung up on the piers there. Mm -hmm. But we, we get out on a river boat uh, once a week, and that's generally May through October. And so that's on the Mississippi River. And we also have, you know, like you saw in the other dots, we don't right now boat on, this, on the Minnesota or the St. Croix. We also take grab samples kind of in the top middle there where you're just dropping it down from a bridge. So there's plenty of locations that look like that. We have some fancy equipment that's the little orange boat. That's a stream pro. We had that at the Battle Creek Regional Park Tour, but we didn't get to put it in the river, but that measures flow. It's a pretty handy, pretty handy tool. Um, middle bottom is our, we it's on the Minnesota River and that's where we measure continuous water quality. And so that's, you know, you have a grab sample, which is a snapshot of time. In the bottom middle, we have a piece of equipment deployed in the river itself. And so that's um, an example where we're getting kind of like dissolved oxygen is a really important for aquatic life. And so that's a primary parameter for us there. And it's actually part of our Metro plant permit. So there's some permit examples there. Yeah. Question? Question? Yeah. Please. Mr. Chair, um, Dan, what if, and Judy, what have you noticed in terms of, of um, the Minnesota River over that period of time that you've been monitoring? Is, is it getting better? Mr. Chair, Council Member, so well, you'll hear about the trends report in a couple of meetings. Okay. And um, so what it's showing is for phosphorus reductions, it looks like it's getting better, but you have to take that and keep that in mind that it's getting better, but it's still really bad. Yeah. So, you know, it is it is getting better, but it's worse. But then if you're looking at nitrogen and nitrates, it's not, so. And chlorides are, are downward trending across, doesn't matter which river you are. And, and so, and, and that's where the, the trends versus the loads, they kind of tell two different types of stories. Yes, we're getting better. And then you look at the load or just how much pollutant is coming. And then you really see a lot of the, the differences between the, up the Mississippi, Minnesota, and the St. Croix. Please. Um, I recently attended a, a gathering that the St. Paul Foundation hosted on water quality. And, um, the Nature Conservancy uh, member of the staff, their co-chair of their water quality project and the former CEO of General Mills all spoke. It was an amazing conversation, but there's an energy around water quality now that I, I've never seen before. And I'm not sure we'll see again if we don't start taking it seriously. How much do we collaborate and share with entities like the Nature Conservancy or Friends of the Mississippi River or other organizations so that we can kind of share our data and build build our agendas and our messages. So Mr. Chair and Council Member, I, for instance, with the Friends of the Mississippi River, every so often they do a State of the River report. A lot of the data that they use in that is from us. So we are working closely with them. Um, it's, you know, for the standard parameters that we're doing, we don't do all the fish data and the biological that they have in there, but most of the chemistry data is from us. So we've been working with them and we work closely with them. Um, it's kind of like the, we work with the Freshwater Society a lot and they use a lot of our data. I don't know, we recently talked one-on-one -on -one or anything with the Nature Conservancy that much, but you know, it's, all of the information is available. We get calls all the time and, and we try to present the results of our information that we collect in our data at like, the water resources conference and other national conferences mm -hmm. ensure that information is where thank you other questions please well thank you chair i just was wondering you were on the uh, chlorine topic where it was getting worse are, are there some things or practices in place to try to reduce the amount of chlorine <laughs> Mr. Chair, committee members, so the, the chloride, which is from salt, the, you know, whether what kind of salt it is, but uh, so there's many different ways to, to tackle salt in our, in our rivers and streams and lakes. Um, you know, the state's really big on tackling the road salt and, and smart salting and, and applications, and, and there's a lot of different policies that I, maybe Judy can expand on the policy side of it, but 
I know that's the big tackle right now from the PCA standpoint is road salts and being smart applications of that. And from kind of our side with water softeners is a big mm -hmm. uh, input to our systems from a wastewater treatment standpoint. So there's some discussions and some strategies that, that I know we're looking into. But uh, I think the big low-hanging fruit, if you will, is the road salts and mm -hmm. salt applications. Did you have any? Yeah, this, no, okay, go. I just had a follow-up. I just was a follow-up. So with the water conditioning people, you know, traditionally it was the, a lot of salt in there, but now they have like the no salt type conditioning. Is there education with some of the water conditioning companies to, to look at the new models without the salt? Or is there a lot of resistance sure. on that type of thing? Mr. Chair, Council Member, I think, you know, there is education about all the different options. I think it's still, right now, the state is really focusing on the road salt reduction. So they spent a lot of time and effort training road salt applicators, as well as applicators of, you know, who are just doing streets and large parking lots and things like that to reduce their salt. A lot of it is pre-wetting the salt, so it reduces the amount and, and it's more efficient on how the salt is used. Um, there is There are conversations about the water softeners as well, and they're making that information available and public. And I think right now they're still focusing a lot more on the road salt versus the conditioners at homes. All right, and then the other thing is, you know, sometimes you see the, you know, so the, a lot of the road salts coming from our own, you know, public uh, partners and that, but as far as the, not, the private uh, sector and their commercial, some of the education going them and residential as well. Yes, Mr. Chair and Council Member, they're, the Pollution Control Agency is really taking the lead. They've done like a, what's it, it's called an impaired water study or TMDL for chloride for the region. And so they're going out and promoting the different practices and they are talking about how they can get more education to those private applicators to help them figure out ways to reduce their salt use as well. Yeah, please. All right, and then typically I know like, you know, we tend to rather than try to treat it, we try to like, you know, source and figure out the problem is and not have to treat it. So I'm kind of wondering a lot of the salt in where, you know, residents are buying at the stores in other states, like I think like Iowa doesn't use salt or at least last time I know you know, using the practice or kind of minimizing or using other best practices. Is there some of the education or push on that a little bit? Sure, Mr. Chair, Council Member. Um, so there's going to be some work that needs to be done in that area because years ago it was like there was a much more high sand content when people were, you know, putting for road safety. And they kind of, they know that sediment is a bad thing in the rivers and the lakes too. So they kind of switch to the salt because it's more efficient and effective, but you kind of switch one bad pollutant for a different one. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, there's really not a great way to treat the salt. I mean, it's, you know, so it's not something that we can really handle at our facilities without a lot of cost. So I think that we're kind of in those conversations right now. What is the best way and how can we move forward on this? And I think they really just been emphasizing how to reduce the amount by doing it more smart and, and maybe you'd like to add something to that Lisa about our facilities because it's not really my area or I'm not to put you on the spot. <laughs> so. I'd just say that it's an active conversation right now. Um, their bigger focus is um, what's going in the stormwater because what's in the wastewater is a part of the problem but it's a much smaller part of it. And so they're trying to tackle the road salt piece. I think the part that comes back to us then on the treatment piece is that communities have um, stormwater retention ponds that are accumulating mm -hmm. at runoff, which contains chlorides, and they need to figure out what to do about that. So um, there isn't a, a treatment option out there for them to get take their stormwater from their holding ponds to get it treated. So we've, we've actually had a community ask us, can we bring that to your plant? And we're like, we don't take chloride out. Mm -hmm. so, so it's starting to bubble to the surface that that might be something that needs a strategy for as well. So, you know, once you put it out there, chloride hangs around, you know. So it does a lot of good, but we need to look at other alternatives, I think, to the chloride solution because it causes a lot of challenges at the back end too. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, I, was, I think one thing to add is, you know, as far as our, um, what Med Council is doing as well, is it's education as far as like private. I know, you know, it's surprising how little you're supposed to add. You know, in the PCA, it's, there's mm -hmm. a lot of education out there. And I know I work at the Metro Plants, and so there's a lot of education about operators who's a, who are applying the salt. 
you know, I don't remember the exact thing, but it's a pretty big square for a single pellet of sand or of salt that it, you're actually supposed to do. So these heaping mounds of it that you might yeah. see at a store or a mall or something like that, you know, the, that's what you're trying to avoid. And so I think from the private and the non, you know, public entities, that's what they're going for is just educating whoever's putting the salt on to not do it as much, mm-hmm. including my driveway. Okay. <laughs> Mine too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, so a few more pictures here, just to get on a little bit of biology. So we do do some aquatic insect monitoring. So in the bottom right, you see some, some nets. And so that's a weightable mm-hmm. stream that we're able to look at some macro invertebrate aquatic insects, which tell us, well, and, and then that little orange hanging thing, those are a few disks, square disks that uh, are hanging in the, in the larger river systems that we anchor to a buoy, essentially. Mm-hmm. And those is where the insects will colonize and live on those little plates. And so we're able to just assess the aquatic life that, that are living there. The chemistry, water quality standards, the whole thing is kind of a guess of what is the ba- you know, what is that standard that it's going to impact life? Well, using these methods, we can actually just assess how is the aquatic life doing? How healthy actually is it? And, you know, the bugs are living there usually all year round. So they're a good measure of that. And so that's another type of monitoring that we do. And then the upper right is that picture of our a report, the river trend report that you'll be hearing more about shortly. Moving on to lakes, we, uh, Julie alluded to the camp program, so I won't get into that too much, but there's a picture of our uh, citizen assisted monitoring program volunteers in the lower left on their boats. And we do that at the, you can barely see the, t- the, the right map, but that's the map we put out annually that shows all the lakes that we monitor and we get grades and you know you give someone a milligram per liter and it's kind of hard to tell if that's good or bad and so we've broken that down to a a, a curve a graded grade curve um, a through f and so we uh, if you look at the little bar chart there blue and the greens and the reds we have more a's than we do f's so we're not a you know we're doing we're on the right side of the bell curve there and you see Brian, our, our lake scientist, who you'll hear from again later, is uh, taking a secchi disc reading. And so we actually have some charts there that show on the left, the secchi depth is increasing over time. So that means you can see it deeper. And then on the right is the chlorophyll, which is a measure of algae going down. So this example is Big Carnelian Lake, and it's getting clearer. You can see deeper there's less algae. So that's kind of what we're looking at, showing those long-term trends regionally, as well as the local water shed organization knows whatever they're doing, keep doing it, it's working. Dan, is that is that an annual report? I know there was a, several um, stories in the media earlier this summer about certain lakes getting A's and certain lakes getting F's. And, is that something that comes out like a certain date on an annual basis? Mr. Chair, yes. It uh, we have this is like an annual summary report that this has put out. It's you know, mm-hmm. th- and it's a program report. So that's something that we, when those stories did, when the writers did get into that, it's not every lake in the region. If you, the there are partners that kind of handle it on their own, and so it's part of their programs. They have the resources to do so. Ramsey County, Minnehaha Creek. Uh, Anoka County, for some examples, there, there, there's. A, if you look at the map, there's not a lot of lakes that are in our program that are up there, and so we don't have grades for them. So, when you're trying to get top ten lakes of the region, it's it's not the best fit for that right now. Mm-hmm. But uh, for the people that are participating in our program, we provide them a grade annually so that they can track that over time and be able to, you know, a lot of them put them in fact sheets and newsletters for their local communities and watershed districts. So it's a big communication tool for them. And Mr. Chair, um, Brian Johnson, our um, lake scientist, will be at our meeting in September to share that report with you and kind of give you more details about that. Normally, the the grades are out earlier in the year, but we are trying to, you know, wait till the appropriate time to kind of start, you know, educating you and letting you know about some of these programs. So that's when it's, it will be happening this year. So, in in Great. kind of response to that publicity we're trying to really put outreach with those groups that are collecting data on their own and try to just get some data from them and and help share that so that we could get a better regional picture and not just kind of what we're partnering with people on so that we can you know be be holistic for the region not just participation council member thank you chair you seem to have a lot of participation in washington county is there a, a backstory to that well they 
Mr. Chair, committee members, they are, they've been a great partner for many years. They are nearby, so that our, they use our laboratory with, through our program, and so there's some convenience to that as well. And we partner with them on stream monitoring, and the Washington Conservation District is the whole county, is countywide, and then they are kind of our partner, direct partner, but they represent several watershed districts that are in there, and so they actually conduct a lot of the monitoring as well, and so it's a little bit of a more unique situation, but there are some volunteers that they'll pick samples up for, which is more like the rest of the region, but they do a lot of, they have a lot of lakes, and so they do a lot of monitoring in Washington County. Good question, yes. Uh, oh, thank you, Chair. This was gonna drill down a little bit deeper, so like, I know you have the big report, but like, does each you know city or lake association get these reports? and? You know counties and things like that so it's pretty well you know, people can look up their lake and say oh I, i'm, I'm a, a d or a c kind of thing sure mr chair council member so every participant who is one of our volunteers gets a copy of the report an email about it or a copy of the report um the agency that sponsored them gets the report the report is available on our website you can actually you know click on go on to our eims website i mentioned Click on a specific link, and it'll give you the, you know, all the reports that we've had for that too. So, okay. but we do make a point of if you're in the program, you get information on here. The report is ready. This is where it's at, or we mail it directly to them. So, all right. Thank I don't you. want to steal too much of Brian's thunder, but that's yeah. what he'll show next time. Okay. Because <laughs> you know the grade is an output, and that's a very popular and used output. But you know graphs, some of that historical context of well, I was an F five years ago, and I'm a C. You know, okay. You know, they want to know that kind of stuff, and that's what the larger report or just that more in-depth stuff gives them. All right, thank you. Maybe that's a clue that it's a time for the general manager's report. <laughs> 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 but we have more questions. Just a real quick one, Mr. Chair. Um, what, there are two shades of blue, the lighter aqua-ish blue, like Carth Lake up there in northern Ramsey County. What is that? Is that a... I think it's just, it's dark blue is an A, light blue is a B. Okay. As far as the gray okay. color dots go. Okay. So ah, got it. I was thinking A was black, but now I get it. It's okay. A, it's a dark blue. Got it. If you're blue, you're good. <laughs> Other questions? Please. All right. I just had one way in the beginning where you talked about best practices and you were working in Empire. But I went to some of the reports that were done by you know the University of St. Thomas, and most of them were using herbicides to prepare the ground. And I'm just wondering, with the studies of the water monitoring and that, is best practices doing things like either pulling or burn or whatever, or are you still using the herbicides as best practices? Sure, Mr. Chair, Council Member. So we don't monitor for herbicides, so we're monitoring mostly for nutrients. And at the river, there's a whole slew of things, but mostly the nutrients and chlorides. Um, so our best practices that we're promoting and that we're talking about are really about stormwater practices are sediments, phosphorus, and nitrogen, typically. All right, so you're not picking up the roundups and the, those type of things? It's... If they're attached to a sediment, sure. Okay. But, but we're not specifically studying that area. So. Okay, all right. And as to follow up, Mr. Chair and committee members, we do partner with the Department of Ag for pesticides at mm -hmm. several sites based on their program. They guide it, and we just collect an extra bottle of water for them whenever they need it. So we are partnering on pesticide monitoring, but herbicides not so much. And as far as um, there are, there is a wet meadow at Empire where they do burn, and we have some native prairies that, that uh, we do, at least at Empire, we've been monitoring that meadow for plant communities kind of pre- and post-burning. So cataloging that kind of management of a, of a native prairie for others want to use that best practice. Okay, thank you. Fantastic, other questions? Excellent report, yeah. really appreciate it. Great. Took a ton of notes, that's for certain. Thank you very much, and that takes us to the general manager's report. Well, uh, there, it's rumored that somebody's on their way to the state fair, so I'll make this really quick. <laughs> um, last spring, several of you attended our um, budget briefings, and we talked about offering our communities tour options. And uh, we're just getting around to do that now because we miss kind of the early season opportunity, and it can be pretty hot doing a plant tour. and in July and August. So we're offering uh, one at Metro in the end of September mm -hmm. and one at Blue Lake in the early part of October. So those are being geared towards our, our cities that are our customers. 
and you guys are certainly um, encouraged to attend those and give you a chance to see who's coming from our communities and, and what kinds of questions they have and interact and get to know some of those folks as well. So um, other than that, I love that you are as interested in tonight's topic and you will really enjoy the drill down of the, the lakes grades and what they're looking at and seeing the, um, the data trends. Um, John Stein, who was the commissioner and now retired from PCA, I've heard him in at least two public meetings, one of them uh, on a national level, talk about how great Minnesota is for having data that goes all the way back to the early 1900s. And then he'd look at me and go, you guys <laughs> did that. <laughs> so we can tell a much better story or a longer story about what all the change has been and what's been accomplished and what's left to be done. And uh, it's really kind of cool to be able to be a part of that because there's things to learn from that that other states can learn from us. So stay tuned for more on that. You don't have exact dates on those, um, the Metro community yes. tours, do you? In September I do. and October? Third is the Blue Lake. October 3rd is Blue Lake and September 26th is Metro. And they're both afternoon, so two to four slots. Right. And you should have a an email with information on it that came out this week. Okay, super. And if you're not finding that, let let Susan and her, or I know, and we'll make sure you get the information and the opportunity to RSVP. Chair, Please. can I just add one more thing? Um, Judy and Dan, I didn't say this during your presentation, but I'm an active volunteer with the Friends of the Mississippi River, and they are awestruck by the Met Council and were especially thrilled when I got appointed to the council and when I, they found out I was going to be a member of this committee. So on behalf of FMR, I just want to say thank you. Um, you guys are great partners, and I was kind of pretending to tee that up for you in terms of my question about partnerships. So not very transparent. <laughs> <laughs> and John Stein heads up. John's now with the Freshwater Society. Freshwater Society. I wasn't sure if it was friends or freshwater. So, okay, good, good partners, both of them. Fantastic. And if unless 